Okay. Well, my name is Lorraine Hawkins, and I am down here at Penn State Mont Alto. Glad not to be driving uh, in the winter time, so it's nice to have this option to do a, a little chat. Um, Elizabeth contacted me in December and uh, asked me about presenting on the Hangman, and uh, I was very happy to actually get that invitation because it meant that I spent part of my holiday break doing something that I had been meaning to do for a while, and that was actually taking a look at um, the courses that I had worked on with some games and, and how students were or possibly weren't using the games and, and what it meant. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of introduction, the reason for using games. And from the introductions, it sounds like everybody's pretty clear on that. So we'll, we'll go very quickly. And then walk through the games that I'm using. I'm using Hangman, uh, and that was the first place I started. And I'm using the Crosswords and Angel. And this summer, I spent some time creating word searches, um, word finds, those kinds of things. And then I'll show you some of the student outcomes and responses. Um, so we'll, we'll get going on this. And of course, the, the reason for games, um, my students hate vocabulary, by and large. But I'm teaching introductory biology uh, for the majors, uh, science and ag majors. And I'm teaching uh, anatomy. And of course, particularly for the anatomy students, you've got to learn how to use the terms correctly. And you've got to learn how to spell them. And once upon a time in the olden days, when I went to school, you dealt with vocabulary lists and flashcards and that kind of thing. And some students still do that, but a lot of them really aren't interested in doing that. Um, there are, is all kinds of work by different publishers to put materials onto websites. And some of those are pretty good. I'm finding that a lot of my students aren't interested. Even if I've got the link straight out of Angel and all they've got to do is click, they just aren't really very interested in logging into the publisher site and using the materials. And beyond that, some of the publisher sites really don't give you much latitude without a tremendous investment from the instructor's point of view, if it's possible at all, to tailor the materials. So you've got your textbook and you've got a canned website that you really can't adjust to the needs of your class. And so looking for alternatives that might be a little more fun, a little more attractive, um, a little more enticing to the students led me to the Hangman Games. Um, and that's where I met Jason Wolf many years ago now. Um, so I want to show you how the Hangman works. And of course, we've got links in here for um, the Hangman Games, and it's very easy to go to the, hang to the Educational Gaming Commons and then uh, look at the look at the games and find the hangman. And it's a basic game, although it doesn't make the hanging person. Um, I've had students who are a little disappointed by that. But you create a, a bank of questions that are fill in the blank questions, and then the students get a chance to try and fill in the blank. Um, so here's how it looks. You go to the the open site and you get a welcome message. It's it's very nice. Um, and you can log in as the instructor. Um, but this is what students would see. And there's a list of courses. And I thought ahead, because I was hoping that this would be very popular one day. And so Jason and I have named my courses all with the course name and then Penn State Mont Alto after it, just, to, just in case we had somebody pick up on this. Um, when you clicked on a particular course, this is my anatomy course, you see a list of the, in, the different topics. Um, so these are the lessons. And these basically match the chapter topics. Um, so it's pretty straightforward for a student to come in and, and decide what they want to play at some particular point. Um, and so if they pick the introduction and the overview, they will see a question. And in this question, it says, the term PEZ refers to the foot, blank refers to the hand. So we're looking for um, the term that refers to the hand. And there are five letters. And then you just click on a particular letter to pick it. You can see I've picked the M uh, to start with. And 
the correct choices fill the letters in, and incorrect choices reduce the guesses that are left. So you can see I've clicked on some other letters here, and over here to the right you see that the number of guesses left has decreased, and it will go to red as you get closer to running out of guesses. Um, and if you can't guess, you guess wrong six times, then it tells you what the answer was, and the answer was that the hand is the mainest. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple from a user's point of view. And if you manage to take another question and you do it properly, you get a, a different kind of message, and the message will say correct and give you the answer as well. So it's, uh, from, from the user's perspective, quite easy. Um, from the instructor's perspective, it's really pretty close to being that easy. You go to uh, manage courses, and as I said, Jason set up these different courses for me and, and put in the titles, and then it's very, very easy. You go in and create the lessons, and you can see here that there's a series of lessons, and they're all marked published. When I'm creating a lesson, I've put in the title, and then it says unpublished while I'm working on it, and I choose when to publish it. Um, and this is what the screen looks like that I'm actually putting things into. And it's just a series of little boxes, and you type away. Um, and the answers go in right over here. And so it really takes nothing, uh, nothing more than a little bit of careful typing to create the, the questions. These lessons, when I first wrote the, the first few, I wrote them just as phrases that I decided really didn't work so well. Um, so completion questions make more sense and are more consistent. Um, and the advantage to doing it that way is that I use completion questions on quizzes, I use them on exams, and so this really does mimic what students would see in cases where it would be worth points. Um, and for my classes, spelling, as I said, is a is an emphasis, as much as many of my students hate that, um, for technical terminology. And so this is a good way to practice getting that spelling down. There are some limitations that are worth sort of noting, so you don't have to find them yourself if you decide to try out the, the hangman games. There are limits on word length. They can't be longer than 18 letters. 18 letters sounds tremendously long. But of course, if you have deoxyribonucleic acids um, and some of those kinds of terms, you can get into longer words. Um, it's easy enough to find other ways to ask about the material, just choosing another term um, in the sentence. So that's not too bad. Uh, terms are also not case sensitive. And they do need to be all letters, so there can't be blanks or apostrophes or anything like that included in the word. Um, but that's not too big a deal. And you want to be careful that you don't accidentally hit a space at the end of you know, your term and that kind of thing. That, that applies to the crosswords as well in Angel, because you will actually enter a character um, in the crosswords. Editing is very simple. Uh, there's an update button at the bottom of each of the at the lessons so that you can make changes, you can make corrections. And I do put in the questions, and then I go back through and play them, trying to catch typos um, before my students see them. That's all. You can look at user rankings, either by course or by lesson. So the lesson that we were just looking at, the introduction and overview for the anatomy course, as of uh, a couple weeks ago, had 145 people who had played this, um, and some of them had played it once and nailed it, and others had played it multiple times and not done nearly so well. Um, that number is now up considerably because we just had our first exam in anatomy last week, and a lot of people decided to play before that uh, exam. So. Hangman has been optional always for my students because I didn't want to have to go through and, and do any translation from these rankings into scores. But it would be possible to do that if somebody wanted to. Uh, I've told people that it would be useful to them in terms of improving grades. 
as of the 1st of January, um, I had Hangman Games for four courses, and the anatomy course was the first one. I've been doing these sort of one course at a time, and the anatomy course is the first one that I created, so it's been used for six semesters now, and uh, has had more than 8,000 plays. So we're up to now for the four courses, uh, more than 10,000 plays as of the 1st of January, and I'm running Biology 129 right now and Biology 240, and I've got people playing in, in both of those courses, so I'm sure the total is, is higher than that mm -hmm. at this point, which is a good thing. Any questions or comments about uh, the hangman before we move to the angel? I, I actually do. Have you uh, surveyed your students at all to see what they think of it, or, or have you received any feedback at like or survey or something? I will. I will talk about that actually as my last slide because I'm getting a lot of comments back on the SRTE open-ended questions. I've gotten questions along the way. I've gotten commentary along the way because anytime there's something wrong, people can't get in for some reason. I hear about it pretty immediately. Um, there have been some cases where we've had temporary um, glitches, and those have been fixed. Thank you very much to the folks at UP who are taking care of the servers and the rest of it. Um, we've had uh, occasionally people get into hassles with trying to use um, Safari or trying to use other browsers or having firewalls that weren't feeling happy about letting people play Hangman. Um, those have been sort of far and few between, but um, anytime, anytime I've got one of those kinds of situations that occurs, I hear about it pretty quickly. So the feedback's been very positive about the Hangman. Um, I had a quick, quick question. Um, uh -huh. When you... I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look, but in terms of like a, a approximate per, a percentage of students in each class that use it, I mean, is it usually a uh, a smaller percentage, or is it? I mean, do you get a lot of users across? Well, I can I can tell you that about 30% of the students in the introductory bio bio 110, and about 40% in the anatomy have played Hangman, and in the two sophomore courses, it's um, it's a higher proportion. Those two sophomore courses are students who have all had Bio 110 with me, and so they've had two semesters worth of push to, to practice their vocabulary. And there it goes up to about half the students. Okay. So the, the uptake is pretty high, for especially considering this is purely voluntary on their part. Right. Um, no, no points involved. Okay? Yep, thank um, you. Did you have an Mary? Oh, yeah, I was uh, curious about uh, how many wrong letters you allow. Did you come up with that number? Is it random? Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't come up with that. That was built into the game, and it's six, six tries before you have uh, had an incorrect. And I have two questions. Sorry. Uh-huh. I have two questions. Uh, one is, I wonder how large do you prepare the, um, you know, the question poll, uh, the question bank, um, for each of the, you know, lessons. And mm -hmm. um, my second question is, how easy it is. I mean, I, I suppose you link um, the Handman game from Angel. So how easy it is for students to link. Um, to get out of out and back into Angel, do they have to go do log in to to access the Handman game or not? You can you log in as a Penn State. It's with your Access ID, so you can go directly to the Educational Gaming Commons and and log in. Anybody who has a Penn State ID can get into these games. They're not protected in any way. Um, I do put links into Angel just to make it easier for my students. I also give them the, the direct address so that they could bookmark it and go there without having to log into Angel first. Mm -hmm. um, each of the lessons has between 15 and 20 uh, fill-in-the-blank questions to it, so it's a it's a pretty good set of questions. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, I have one other question. Okay. 
By any chance, do you have any uh, data that uh, you've collected where this has helped improve students' grades? You are you are ahead of me by just a moment, and I will get to that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's that's exactly why I was glad to have the invitation because I went back and actually looked at that. Awesome. Uh, some other games that that have been used. <clears throat> Angel will let you do either crossword or Jeopardy style category games, and I've never found a comfortable way to do the Jeopardy style games. I've played with it, and it just frustrates me. Um, making the categories is just takes way too much work. But you can do crosswords, which are basically the same idea as the hangman. They're completion statements. You've got the same sorts of constraints. They need to be letters. They're not case sensitive. Users in this case can get hints. So you can ask to have a letter filled in if you're lost. Um, the hints will reduce the store. The instructor can track crossword use in ANGEL, and in different classes I've used that either as optional practice or for bonus points. Uh, in my 240 class right now, students are using them for bonus points and are very enthusiastic about that. Uh, and so here's a, what the simple crossword looks like. It's different than a crossword on paper because all you see is the questions, and what you would have to do is come up here and click on one of these um, pieces to actually get the hint. And so when you do that, you get um, the hint up here. And it says, a blank is any of a group of complex biochemical entities consisting of genetic material encased in protein that must use a cell to produce copies of itself. Examples include HIV and influenza. And you can see down here, I've started to fill in virus. And if I fill in a wrong letter, um, it'll give me a, a dark square with a red um, letter in it. And you can ask for hints over here. And so it's pretty straightforward, again, from a user's perspective. Now, the one thing that is a little bit odd is that the question box actually appears over top of the crossword. So unlike um, a crossword in a newspaper, you, you have to look ahead of time to see where you've got letters that might appear, because they don't get just filled in. Does that make sense to you? Those don't, those don't appear already present in the word. But when you fill in a puzzle, you get the whole thing filled in. And then you can this button will appear, and you can submit it. And it'll tell you that you did 10 questions in 10 tries and only took one hint. And so you've got a 98 in this case. Um, so it's, it's pretty straightforward to set these up as well. The creator view is, is equally simple. It's a lot like what we looked at for the hangman. Um, you've got a set of questions, and you have to have at least five questions. Um, and you put in the answers. And the one thing, as I said, that you want to be careful about is not hitting the space bar at the end. Because if you put in the extra space, it'll appear as a space in the crossword. Um, I'm experience on telling you that you want to not do that. Um, habits you get into typing on a keyboard. Um, so the, the newest thing that I've tried doing is building word searches. Um, again, because this is, you know, this is all about ways to practice vocabulary. And a lot of people do enjoy word find, word search kinds of things. And uh, my husband and I were doing them um, in just commercial ones. And I was looking because. Um, the layouts are a bit different. So I compared a number of the commercial little word search games for the layouts and tried some different layouts out on, on some folks here in terms of how big is the puzzle and how big does the type need to be to make it attractive, and which, and which font do you want to use as well to make it attractive and easy to see. Um, if you go to your local grocery store and look at the magazine counter, you'll see that there are, is a lot of variation in the word finds from very small text in very small puzzles. And in some cases, I at least find it relatively hard to look at the puzzles because of the fonts and, the, and, and things that they've. So I ended up creating a template in Word and used a 20 by 20 table with 16 pitch font in Calibri because it was a, a simple font and pretty clear and then created three boxes down here to put the terms into. 
and use the same font in a somewhat smaller size. So it's 11 pitch down below. And so I save that as a template. When I start to new word search, I open that template and promptly rename it um, with the name of the puzzle. And I start then by developing the word list. And typically this is six to 10 words per box. So a total of 18 to 30 terms. And then I start putting the words into the grid. And of course they can go any direction. And um, you want to make sure that you don't always start in the same place, of course, because it's easy to start with that kind of habit. And I quickly found that I needed to bold the terms down here as I put them in so I didn't lose track of what I had done because I don't necessarily put them in in order. Um, I put them in, you know, the longest ones first usually because they're going to dictate where I can fit the, small, the shorter words. Filling in the background is probably the part that puts most people off the idea of, of doing a word search. Because if you ever try doing this, what you'll find if you're just doing it freehand is that you start repeating. You've got favorite letters, you've got favorite combinations of letters, and um, you begin just repeating, you know, it's the QWERTY thing all over again. And so what I did was I found the frequency of letters in English in the Oxford Dictionary. And this would be time to put that in. Um, when there we go. OK. And then I created an Excel spreadsheet of these letters at the right frequency. So I put in 57 E's and 43 A's and so on. And next to the, the very long list of letters, I created a random sort column so that I could just click on the random sort column and shuffle these letters. And then I could use that set of whatever the sequence of letters was to fill in the blanks around the words. And uh, so there's my, there's my letters and my random sort column and, and I'm filling things in around a set of words. And here I am. And I found that going up and down was quickest because you don't have to do multiple clicks like you do when you're going backwards. Um, so here I am with the letters that I still need to fill in remaining. Pretty straightforward. After that, to make it pretty, it's a matter of removing the outlines from the table and the outlines from around the boxes down below and debolding things and that kind of thing, and then saving it in Word. And then I print a copy and proof it, because every once in a while I make a mistake. And bless my husband for reading a whole lot of biology terms this summer. Um, and once it's been proofed, then I save it as a, a PDF file for posting, because I don't want somebody to print it off and start changing things and then come back and say, well, oh, this wasn't right. Um, but this is, this is something that I post in Angel, again, for um, optional work. And students have been pretty receptive to this, too. Even if they don't play the game, they've got a vocabulary list down here. So there are, actually are some other uses for the list. And so just to summarize and, and show you what the students have done with it, at this point I have hangman games for four biology, student, uh, biology courses developed over time. I have crosswords for three of the four. I haven't done crosswords for the anatomy, and I probably should. Um, and then I have word searches for two of the, the courses. In addition, I've got open book quizzes that I've created. I've got PowerPoint files that are available to them after lecture. I've created audio primers, uh, MP3, and pop-up text um, in Angel. And I've started using the iStudy learning skills modules as bonus work. And it's amazing what students will do if you tell them it's bonus work. Um, if I told them it was required, I'd get all kinds of moaning. Instead, I open this stuff up usually three or four weeks ahead of the fall semester and, and invite students in who've come through FitCap. And I get a lot of folks taking the learning skills uh, modules because it's bonus points. It's good. Um, so the thing that I hadn't done, you know, I've been listening to the commentary for the students, but the thing that I hadn't done was actually go back and systematically look at what the students were doing. And so the invitation from Elizabeth 
was enough to make me spend um, part of my holiday break looking at the activity logs in ANGEL for fall. So I looked at Biology 110 and I looked at Biology 129 and compared what students were doing. And so you can see I had 78 students who finished, completed the course in 110 and 63 and 129. And I broke them out by whether they were uh, successful or so-so or not successful, DNF. And then I dropped all the C students out because what I wanted to do was, was really have a, as good a contrast as I could between the successful and not successful students. Okay? So from here on out, I'm comparing A and B students as successful students and DNF students as unsuccessful. And one of the things that I guess was kind of good to see was that there weren't systematic differences in the timing of their first log into ANGEL. So the, the students who came out on either end of the spectrum were doing about the same thing in terms of logging in um, before orientation weekend, that's early, or logging in at or after orientation weekend ahead of classes starting. Now all these guys get notice ahead of time because I'm sending emails out to them telling them, you know, come on in, look at our ANGEL site, we've got the syllabus up, there are some things you can do to, to get ready for class. Um, and they're all doing about the same thing, at least coming in and looking around. One thing that was interesting was that the successful students really are using ANGEL more frequently. So this is the number of students on the vertical axis. And this is the number of times they logged in during the semester. And you can see a pretty clear um, difference in the, in the um, distribution there in the Bio 110 and a fairly, fairly good one in the 129 as well. Successful students were doing more of the bonus learning skills modules. That's not too big a surprise because they're wanting to uh, make sure that they're going to be successful. They're paying a little bit more attention to what's going on. Um, the students who had access to crosswords um, were using them. So crosswords weren't available for the anatomy, but they were available and were getting used pretty heavily for the Biology 110 group. And Here's the part I knew you guys would want to see. Um, the successful students were playing the hangman. And in fact, in the anatomy group, were playing a lot of hangman. So what I did was broke out um, the students who didn't play at all versus played at least once. Okay, Didn't get too much further than that. Um, but they were checking it out and trying, trying it out. Um, for the students who did play Hangman, so they'd logged in at least once, there were a lot of uh, differences between the number of games that they played as well. So the successful students were playing more games. And for Bio 110, there were 14 lessons. And we had some students who were playing more than 50 games. So they were playing and replaying um, sort of from actually from about this point to the right. Um, for Bio 129, the successful students, again, were, were playing a lot of Hangman as well. I did look at the average score for the Hangman plays, um, because you get noted as having played just for opening the lesson. And there were more students who were more successful in terms of scores, because those scores are tracked as well. Um, so what I've got here is average scores. So the score total divided by the number of games you played. Um, and I had some Bio 110 students who were really doing a pretty good job of nailing the vocabulary. Interestingly, in 129, that's not so much the case. And there are a lot of lower scores. And low scores can mean a couple of things. They might have started games and not finished them. They might have made a lot of mistakes. Um, they might have had some other kinds of things where they were really just sort of looking at the questions but not necessarily really succeeding.
competing at typing in the answers in the same way. So I think the, the fact that we've got a difference between the two classes is a little bit interesting. So the other thing that I looked at is, okay, so I've got all these resources and I'm, I'm trying to add some different resources because I think there's value in having a variety of different ways because different people learn differently and some people like to look at things and some people like to hear things and all the rest of it. So how is it that students are actually using the resources? In Bio 110 and in 129, so Intro Bio and Anatomy, they've got Hangman games. They've got only the crosswords in the 110 course for the fall group. They've got word searches in both. They've got required open book quizzes in Angel for both. They've got access to the PowerPoints and the audio primers and the learning skills. In 110, they also have a list of learning objective statements from the publisher. And I do have essays on my exams in both classes. So there's, again, an incentive to look at those as well. And the successful students are using a pretty good range of the resources that are available. Um, a, little, a little bit maybe of a difference in the 110 group in terms of the less successful students not really poking around at least and seeing what's out there. Um, not so much of a difference in the 129. So they're at least looking. I did look at some of the different resources and the successful students in 110 we're using the learning skills at a little bit higher rate. Interestingly, it's reversed in the anatomy group. Um, just about everybody is using the audio primers and the PowerPoints, and in 110 also using the learning objectives. So there's not a, there's not a big differential in, in any of those factors. Uh, in terms of games, successful students were more likely to engage with the games. And some of these are some pretty substantial differences in terms of the percentage of the students that are using different games. Uh, and it's consistent across the different types of games, the crosswords and the hangman and the, and the word search, the more successful students are using the games. Now, that doesn't let me say that the games are causing them to be more successful. We don't have cause and effect, but we certainly have a pretty strong correlation there in terms of the directionality. And, uh, one more thing that I wanted to share, and that is something that I have just looked at. Our new SRTEs that are available online have a, a free response, two free response questions. <coughs> one of them says, what helped you learn in this course? And for the anatomy for the spring and the fall, and for the fall uh, introductory biology, had some pretty high rates of, of comments. Um, and more interestingly to me, between 40 and 50, 44 and 53 percent of the comments mentioned the hangman or crosswords or games in general without specifying which ones as being one of the things that helped them learn in the course. So along with all of the commentary that I hear in class, the fact that students took the time to mention that in their comments on these SRTEs, I think, is a real endorsement of, of using the games as a way to help students learn the materials. So offering a, a diversity of resources really does seem to have a payoff. Uh, the audio primers and the PowerPoints and the learning objectives for the course that had them were used by nearly everybody. Um, the students who were more engaged as, as uh, revealed by visits to ANGEL and the games that are played do perform better. And for this group, more importantly, students are willing to use the games um, and, and seem to actually be enjoying the games and finding them helpful and certainly expressing appreciation. And, and playing the word games and better performance in courses, especially sort of courses that I teach that are, that are really heavy vocabulary courses, does seem to go together. So that's pretty cool to find out after writing a whole lot of game questions. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I, I said a thank you to Jason. Uh, he was the one who has been 
a big help with getting me started with the Hangman Games. And I also wanted to make sure I said thank you to Elizabeth for getting things set up for this brown bag. So, commentary and uh, suggestions, other uses, um, certainly welcome. And I do want to give you guys one more address because I have created a word find, a word search just for the participants here, and it's posted on my blog site. Uh. <laughs> and uh, I will uh, actually send it to you all as an attachment too, because I have your everybody who's registered for this session. I've got your email. So. And are we going to get any extra credit for that? Yeah, I was going to say, do we get extra credit? <laughs> it's just for practice. It'll help you though. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Commentary, questions, suggestions for future use? This, this is Fred, and I have one comment, and it goes beyond just the gaming stuff, but you had a number of DNF students that looked like they tapped into everything that you had, mm -hmm. and yet, which, which is some indication of effort. But yet they still got a D or an F. Let, let, me, let me tell you what I saw, because I was curious about that too. What I saw some students doing, because I was going through the ANGEL uh, activity logs to compile these numbers. So I spent a lot of time in, in December, early January, looking at ANGEL logs. Some of these students were very busy clicking on anything and everything. Okay. And so they would click their way through items, which meant they were getting counted by the system. But you would look at the log, and it does a timestamp. And they were clicking on items and staying there for three seconds. Okay. Okay. So I find that interesting because I'm wondering whether I should actually be watching for some of that behavior early on during the courses, and then calling those students in and saying, "Look, you know, you." You are maybe feeling like you're doing what you ought to do to work on this course, but this doesn't have a payoff. Um, you know, if you've opened six PowerPoint files from six different course sessions, you know, and you've spent three seconds on each of them, you haven't done anything with that, that material. That's a great point, and I know with Angel and, and other learning management systems. You might have the ability to access that data, but you have to manually go in and sort through it and then make some inferences. And That's really, right. That's right. If we come up with something, we're not going to do it with Angel, obviously, but whatever we choose, it would be interesting to have something that could automate that so you, you know, identify the mad clickers. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, and actually, and that's part of the reason that, having seen that, was part of the reason that I went in and looked at average scores. Um, for the Hangman games, too, because it's pretty clear. You know, it's one thing to say, okay, these students have gone and explored the resources. That's good. That's a first step. But if all they're doing is opening it and then closing it again, or they're opening and asking the system to fill in the terms instead of actually trying to do it themselves, they're going to have really low scores. And yeah, they will have seen the vocabulary, but they haven't actually exercised their brains. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if they're trying to do shortcuts, they're going to find out probably that that doesn't pay off, and so that's where you get your D's and F's. Um, but that's a hard way to find that out. So it is it is interesting to see what the what the students who aren't successful are actually doing because it's it's qualitatively different behavior in a lot of cases. A question I have and it, it may be sort of obvious, but I mean obviously this is good for practicing vocabulary, mm -hmm. but what do you think the advantage of a word game is over just say giving them a practice quiz or some kind of jeopardy? Well, they have practice quizzes too okay. um, for, for my classes. And the, the reason that I – these practice quizzes are open book quizzes that they have open for a week ahead of the scheduled lecture session. And the reason I started doing those now a lot of years ago is because I got tired of the deer-in-the-headlight look when I came into class. You know, and we'd start talking about material, and there would just be these blank stares. 
because nobody had read the material, or, or very few students had read the material. I can't say nobody. And so the idea with the open book quizzes in ANGEL, um, which actually this fall I changed, this fall, this spring, might have been this spring, um, I changed so that they can now take each quiz up to five times if they want to. And I've got them, I've got the, their sh the quizzes are shorter, so they're five questions from the chapter. But it, if they go in and take it again, they get a different selection of quizzes because it's drawn out of a bigger pool. Um, and again, it's it's one more way to practice with the material. Um, and part of my reason for putting together the word searches is that not everybody has easy access to the computers all the time. So you can go in and, and print those off and you know take them to your kid's softball game or, or wherever or whatever you need to be doing where you don't have access to the computer. And you can still be working on some of your vocabulary. Um, so I think offering a, a variety of, of ways for students to engage with the information is a, is a real positive, um, whether that's with games or quizzes or, um, you know, we have to do some of the testing because we've got to have a reason to come up with the grades. But um, I think the variety is good. Lorraine, this is Brett again. What, what percentage of adults, returning adult students, do you have at your campus? For the campus as a whole, it's a, probably about a third. Okay. So it's a fairly high proportion. The Bio 110, 220, 240 students are nearly uniformly traditional age students. Okay. Okay. The Bio 129, the anatomy group, is aimed at our allied health majors, the associate degrees we have on our campus. And so that is probably more than half um, non-traditional. Okay. So that's a, that's a very different group in a lot of respects. Um, we do have traditional age students in the group, but, but it's got a very high non-traditional um, component. And, and they, they have been very receptive um, to the games. So I don't see I don't see a differential in terms of conversation at least in their willingness to go play the games, and in fact a lot of them seem to appreciate the fact that these are not graded um, opportunities, but they are ways for them to get more practice ahead of the things that will matter for the grades. A lot of a lot of the adult students that I work with are are nervous about coming back to school. Um, and so this seems to be a confidence building opportunity for them. So the even the adult students respond well to the game. They do. They do. Um, and and seem to sometimes appreciate the chance to not feel pressured for a little while. I've got a link in the. Uh, Angel site for anatomy to something called the Anatomy Arcade, which is a, a silly, you know, goofy um, set of games that somebody outside of Penn State has created, and they're drag and drop labeling and all kinds of things with goofy kinds of uh, music and the rest of it. And students, students seem to enjoy those. One more way to practice when you aren't in class or in lab. Lorraine, it seems like you spent a lot of time on the word search manually creating them. Did you mm -hmm. look for any software that's out there that you could have used to create these things for you? I, at one point, had found some shareware that created crosswords. Um, and that's long, long gone, and Angel will let me do that. I didn't look for word search um, software. But once I created the template and created the Excel spreadsheet with the RAN, it's actually very quick to create these um, word searches. I probably spend an hour per game, starting from the point of actually picking out the vocabulary terms. So it's cool. it's not a huge investment. The 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 piece that took the more time was actually figuring out how to get it set up. I used a random generator for one that's just free, freely available online, but this was a few years ago, so I had to mm -hmm. go look at my bookmark. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And the reason that I did the Excel spreadsheet, of course, is that I want I want the background letters to look like the real distribution of letters in English. Yeah, so that was an easy way to do that. Um, okay. So Mary Lou typed in a reference to soft chalk with games that are compatible with Angel. I don't know that. You know, soft chalk, soft chalk is a really a it's a WYSIWYG editor for putting web pages and many websites together, and it's it's very very good. Um, okay. Um, but really, for on the game side, I, I think some of the stuff I'd look at is from Respondus. Uh, so if you go to Respondus.com, they have something called StudyMate. Okay. And there's a bunch of games in there where basically it's, it's they don't say this, but it's database driven. So you go and type all your stuff in one place, uh -huh. and it gets out a variety of games using that stuff. Okay. Um, now you have to be careful because. Some of those games that get spits out are Flash based, and that's true of Soft Chalk as well. Soft Chalk can do stuff with JavaScript or Flash. Um, so you got to be careful to make sure that, you know, if you're using the Flash stuff, that you let people know. Right. Some of the mobile devices and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, by and large, it's, it's pretty good stuff. So Soft Chalk's one, uh, Study Mate by Respondus is another one that will let you do Flash cards and that sort of thing. Uh, this is this is Jeff. I have a quick question. Um, you made some comparisons. I mean, clearly from your your slides, it looks like there's a, a clear relationship between, um, I mean, final grades and those who use the tool a lot and those who did not. I was curious if you're able to look at um, maybe those who who got a good grade and did not use the um, the final tool, and if there was a difference, a noticeable difference between the the final grades between your successful who used the tool a lot and those who were successful and didn't use the the tool at all. A difference in what respect? Uh, just final final grade. I mean, so uh, I, I guess maybe the actual points. So I don't know. I mean, were they basically the same, approximately equally successful, or uh, I guess were there difference? I'm just curious if there was a difference between uh, those that did not use the tool and were successful versus those that used the tool a lot and were successful. I haven't done that comparison, but. The successful students were all A and B students, and that means that the great majority of those students were in the B range. Okay. So I'm not sure that that comparison really would tell me all that much. Sure. Um, the thing that that I found encouraging was that uh, you know that sure there's some there does seem to be a differential. The games are are helping. I hope the the students or at least the successful students are using the games. Um, but I was also glad to see the commentary on the SRTEs. We've got folks that, that seem to be feeling better about what they're doing in the courses and finding the games helpful. Um, and I think that's probably the best endorsement right there, um, that they're feeling like this is a, a valuable way to spend some time and practice with the material. I had, you know, I had thoughts of, yeah, I've seen all these students and I've seen all these lists of users and I'm going to find out that, you know, there's not really a payoff and, and that wasn't what I found. So that was uh, reassuring. I, I had a question um, when Brett was mentioning Flash. Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned there were some issues with Safari. Mm -hmm. uh, were there any other technical glitches any of the students had? or reported about usability or? Very occasionally I will have a student who tells me they log into Hangman and see the first question repeatedly. Okay. Um, that's, there's, there hasn't been a particular pattern that I can find with that. It hasn't been consistent. It's almost always from a home computer. And so what I just tell students, because they're using this you know, for their own sort of practice, is if you've got a computer where that keeps happening, please come try it from the campus computers because it doesn't happen here. I've not seen that happen myself. Um, 
but I do wonder about you know whether it's a browser issue, whether it's a a, a security settings issue of some sort. Um, I know I just had to I, I started playing with VoiceThread and I just had to I can use it fine from my computer at work, but my computer at home I had to um, make some adjustments to my firewall. Mm -hmm. to, to be able to interact with the software because it would just load and load and load and load and load and never get anywhere. Um, so I don't I don't know what the issue is with that. Um, and the students usually don't know enough about their computer to be able to even answer some basic questions about yeah. what and when the they are. Is. That's to say, when they are in the lab, they're also on the Penn State network. That's right. That's right. And and we've not had problems there. Well, we're about out of time, so uh, okay. any last questions? Well, thanks again, Lorraine. This is well, great. We've had Hangman for a few years, but uh, sometimes it's good to remind people of what we have. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. It's easy to use. It's easy to write the questions from the instructor's endpoint, and, and the students uh, find it easy to use too. So worth worth playing with it. And and it's quick enough to write that you don't, you know, other than setting up the course, you haven't lost a whole lot of time if you do decide that you don't want to continue with it. Um, it's not a huge upfront investment. That's good. Yeah. But I think you'll get hooked. Well, thank you for all for attending. And if you have comments, you have suggestions, uh, I'd be glad to hear from you because I'm always looking for new ways to try and engage my students. Um, always happy to hear new possibilities. Yeah, do you want to put your email address in the chat room? Sure. And you can also send them to gaming at psu.edu. As I said, I'll I'll send out the special word search so everybody will have my <laughs> everybody will have my email too. Homework. <laughs> Just fun. Just fun. All right, I'm probably gonna end the recording, which I believe uh will okay. make everyone hang up, but uh so thanks again, Lorraine and Thank you. Goodbye. Nice little tones. So I'm going to okay, send